All right, let's do this one last time. In 2018, Sony Pictures Animation changed the face of animation by releasing their unique take on the beloved Marvel character that has been around since, well, forever. This time, though, there's a new face wearing the mask. Well, actually, there are several. There have been many Spider-Mens and Spider-Gwens across each incarnation in the comic books, but more than anyone else, this is the story of Miles Morales. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and here are 107 facts about Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Fact number one. Producers Amy Pascal and Avi Arad first approached producer duo Phil Lord and Chris Miller in 2014 and asked them if they wanted to work on an animated Spider-Man movie. The duo told them they'd only do it if it was a Miles Morales story, which the studio accepted, to their surprise. Number two. Production of the movie took three years, which is shorter than the usual production time of animated feature, which ranges between five and six years. And sometimes, like in the case of Arcane, even animated shows can take up to six years of production. Not that Spider-Verse looks rushed or anything, considering it's one of the best-looking animated films of all time. Number three. The first year and a half of production was dedicated to figuring out the technical and visual aspects, whereas the rest, barely more than a year's worth of time, was used to figure out the rest. Number four. And if you think that sounds crazy, then you can only imagine what the ordeal must have felt like for those involved. It took the crew one week to animate one second in the movie. Depending on the complexity of the shot, some crew members hit larger numbers than that, but one animated second per week was roughly the average output overall. In hindsight, it's crazy that they managed to stick to the deadline, but this just speaks for the idea that passion is one of your most valuable assets. But, you know, ideally a lack of crunch can also go a long way. Number five. Speaking of, bagel! Watch out for Spider-Man, you never know what's gonna hit you. Did you know that the bagel caption in this scene stems from a mistake? The word bagel was actually a storyboard note which got misinterpreted during production, but it eventually was left in for the comedy. Number six, Miles is Afro-Latino, being both black and Puerto Rican, and having a BIPOC protagonist is still a big deal in our age. Chris Miller and Phil Lord specifically wanted to tell Miles' story because there aren't many like him on the big screen, which is a very noble mission of theirs. And hey, if done right, which this movie clearly did, it can inform aspects of the character heretofore unseen. Sometimes it's a leap of faith. And besides, to anyone who might have been butthurt about doing a Miles movie before the movie came out, he had already been Spider-Man in the comics for like over half a decade, come on. Number seven. Every single frame in the movie was first animated in CG and then animated by hand. This hybridized style creates a unique visual of different blending art styles that make it look like you're experiencing a comic book in real time. Developing the visuals was no easy feat though, and undoubtedly proved to be the biggest challenge for the film crew. This type of hybrid animated tech would later be used in movies like The Mitchells vs. The Machines. Number eight. Getting a bit technical here, in standard film you would shoot at 24 frames per second, whereas in traditional hand-drawn animation it's 12 drawings per second. While much of the movie's elements are rendered at 24 FPS, certain parts, such as Miles' movements when he first starts using his powers, are only rendered at 12 FPS, meaning that only every other frame in this movie is a different image, making the images on screen sharper, but also giving a bit of a sluggish, laggy feel. The difference is most notable as he and Peter B. Parker, a fully realized Spider-Man, swing through the forest together. However, Miles becomes animated at 24 frames per second once he becomes a more capable Spider-Man. Number 9. This fun frame rate easter egg would receive an amazing shout in Insomniac Games' Spider-Man Miles Morales, where the Spider-Verse suit displayed a similar cut frame style to the film during gameplay, and it's the only correct way to play the game unless you have the Bodega Cat suit. Number 10. Art directors Dean Gordon, Patrick O'Keefe, and their team turned to cubism to help represent the dimensional quakes. Cubism art often presents a collection of different views all happening at the same time, so it was a natural metaphor for the multiple universes converging in the movie. Number 11. Around the time that Phil Lord and Chris Miller were toying with the idea of doing a new animated Spider-Man movie, Lord visited a retrospective in New York about Jeff Koons. Koons is a postmodern pop artist known for reframing the everyday in unexpected ways, like his iconic balloon animals made with stainless steel. Jeff Koons' art inspired Lord and Miller to come up with a fresh perspective on the Spider-Man story for Spider-Verse, as it's a series that has been rebranded, rebooted, and retold ad nauseum. Lord and Miller wanted to create something they've never seen before, and in the process, see if they could create something akin to a postmodern superhero film. Number 12. Stan Lee gets his requisite spoken cameo in Spider-Verse, of course, but he actually appears in several scenes in the background. The animation supervisor was kind of grumpy about that and begrudgingly had to pass out scenes to different animators wanting to animate Stan Lee themselves. Number 13. Lee's speaking role essentially being one of the moments where the film's theme is explicitly said to the viewer isn't an accident either. Lord and Miller wanted Lee's cameo to be meaningful since they considered him so integral to the heart of the character of Spider-Man. Lee himself even said long before the release of the film that he was grateful for the happy accident of Spider-Man's face being fully covered. Because of that detail, anyone reading Spider-Man could imagine themselves as the hero and, say it with me now, anybody can wear the mask. Number 14. 
That ideal that anybody can wear the mask is the main theme that the filmmakers wanted to express and represent in the movie to empower audiences. So yeah, you could be Spider-Man, though we're not liable in case of any accidents you might suffer. You do not have Spidey senses. Probably. Number 15. Completing the animation for the film required up to 180 animators, the largest crew ever used by Sony Pictures Animation for a film at the time. Number 16. This film was dedicated in memory of Spider-Man co-creator Steve Ditko, who died on July 6, 2018, while this film was finishing production. However, this wasn't the only dedication, as a month before the film was released, Stan Lee passed away on November 12, 2018. The film was dedicated to both of Spider-Man's creators. Lee's passing gave his aforementioned cameo all the more weight, as it made Spider-Verse one of the final cameos Lee recorded by himself. He's made posthumous cameos since then, but very few of them feature him speaking, for obvious reasons. Number 17. The commentary track was recorded just a few weeks after Stan Lee's death. They mentioned that they went to Lee's office to record his vocal work. He was the only person that they went to while everyone else came to their studio to record. Number 18. When Jefferson scrolls through his phone contacts, Steve Ditko is shown as one of the contacts. This also is, of course, a reference to Ditko. Number 19. Another phone contact is T. McFarlane, a reference to comic creator Todd McFarlane, perhaps best known for creating Spawn, but McFarlane also worked many years on the Amazing Spider-Man comic. Number 20. Lee's other spoken cameo as J. Jonah Jameson in the movie's post credit scene is a reference to his long-standing claims that Jameson is an exaggerated potshot at himself. Number 21. Daniel Pemberton followed the ambitious lead of the Spider-Verse animation by developing an equally intricate score. After all the musical elements had been recorded, they were recorded again onto vinyl and then re-scratched into the mix to give an extra authentic baked-in feel. Number 22. Miles Brooklyn includes a shop called Romita Ramen, a reference to artist John Romita Sr., who took over drawing Amazing Spider-Man after Steve Ditko's departure and played a major role in defining the character for mainstream audiences. Number 23. The shot of Miles falling slash ascending into his station as Spider-Man was originally written in the very first draft of the script simply as a stage direction. Though, looking at the final screenplay, it looks like they knew they had something. They might not have known it would become the most defining visual of Miles Morales, but you can tell they were excited. Number 24. Phil Lord describes the Aunt May of Spider-Verse as kick-ass and feisty. The filmmakers were actually thinking of Lily Tomlin for Aunt May when they were writing the script, so they were happy when she accepted the role. Sometimes it just works out that way. Number 25. This is certainly true for Miles himself, or rather his voice actor Shamik Moore, who had no previous experience in voice acting and revealed in an interview that Miles Morales was his dream role. During the time when he was working on another movie, Moore was following the Law of Attraction and used a journal given to him by his co-star where he wrote down affirmations of being Miles Morales, something that would later become reality. So never say you can't manifest your dreams. Number 26. Miles and Peter B. Parker's voice actors, Shamik Moore and Jake Johnson, recorded their lines together in the audio booth, which was essential to the characters' on-screen dynamic, as the majority of the cast recorded their lines individually. Another duo that got to record their dialogue together was Moore and Brian T. Henry, who plays Miles' dad, Jefferson. Number 27. The car ride with Miles in the back and his dad driving was recorded with their voice actors sitting in chairs set up like a car to give them the proper dynamic. Number 28. Moore, Johnson, and Haley Steinfeld, who voices Gwen, were recording and re-recording lines for a couple of years, though the trio never got to share a booth together. Number 29. Another cast member who had their debut in voice acting is Luna Lauren Valles, who plays Miles Mamarillo, who's a paramedic. Number 30. The movie takes place in 2018, when Miles is 13, making him one of the youngest members in the cast and a generally younger Spider-Man than we're used to seeing on the big screen. Number 31. For reference and additional contrast, Gwen Stacy and Penny Parker are 15 and also 13 years old, respectively. Number 32. Gwen says that she's older than Miles by 15 months. In real life, Haley Steinfeld, who voices Gwen, is actually a year younger than Shamik Moore. Number 33. According to Bob Paraschetti, one of the movie's three directors, the very first cut of the movie, which was called Cabin Fever, was three hours long. One of the few times where I can say I actually would have loved to have seen that cut. Number 34. Due to the large amount of ideas that the crew had, they had to shuffle a bit, and once the heart of the movie, Miles and his family, was set, the movie started becoming more concise. But according to co-director and co-writer Rodney Rothman, no characters were cut, and most of the movie's fundamental bones from the first draft remained in its final version. Number 35. Ultimately, though, with a project as big as this one, sometimes you can't prevent cut scenes. Ten minutes of finished animation landed on the cutting room floor. Number 36. The decision of giving Miles his own team of allies came about when the filmmakers wanted to include an older Peter Parker in a mentor role and thereby deviate from the usual formula of Spider-Man movies. In order to make that happen, the concept of the multiverse was introduced. Number 37. Gwen was the first choice to include in Miles' group of heroes. 
The choices for the remaining group members were made based on the criteria that they were a diverse cast of characters that looked nothing alike, had different experiences, and could be animated in completely different styles, which already sounds ambitious enough as it is, which makes you appreciate the end product even more. Number 38. Among the various Easter eggs featured in the movie are titles of projects of authors and filmmakers and musicians that the Spider-Verse crew contacted. They asked these various artists what projects they would make in an alternate universe, which ended up scattered across the shot scene in New York. One of these projects, which can be seen on a billboard in Times Square, is Hold Your Horses, which is what Rodney Rothman dubbed it after being told by Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg exactly that over an email. Basically, they gave him an idea and then immediately told him to not include it and to hold his horses because they might actually end up making the project. Even that became a fun visual gag. This movie is flawless. Number 39. When asked by Rothman, filmmaker Edgar Wright replied he would make the movie From Dusk Till Shawn, a sequel to his existing movie Shaun of the Dead, which made it into a billboard in the movie. Number 40. Other people whose alternate projects are featured in the movie are writers George Saunders, Marlon James, and Sarah Vowell. If you freeze a shot in the city, a cab driving in the background features an ad for an alternate George Saunders book. Number 41. One of the billboards in Times Square is for a film called Clone College featuring Abraham Lincoln and JFK, which is a reference to Phil Lord and Chris Miller's cancelled series Clone High. Wait, does this mean that this project's never gonna happen in our universe? I need to sit down. I don't know if I can go on with this knowledge. It's all I've been waiting for, for I don't know how long. Number 42. But hey, let's really get into the metaverse. Rodney Rothman was born in New York and grew up in Forest Hills in Queens, which is where Peter Parker is from. But have you ever seen Peter Parker and Rodney Rothman in the same room together? Makes you think, huh? Yeah? No? Number 43. The scene in Gwen's flashback, which features Gwen fighting a giant lizard, is based on Peter Parker's death in Gwen's comic, where Peter used a serum to turn himself into the lizard and seek revenge on his bullies, wanting to be like Gwen. Due to not having a lizard model, the movie's lead animator, Nick Kondo, heavily modified the Green Goblin's rig to make it look like the lizard from Gwen's comics. Number 44. Spider-Man Noir, who is voiced by Nicolas Cage, is imbued with traits of typical 1930s and 40s film stars. Some inspirations for his performance that Cage mentioned are film stars like James Cagney, Humphrey Bogart, and Edward G. Robinson, some of whom talked fast and imbued their performances with certain rhythms when they spoke, see? Watch Little Caesar, Double Indemnity, perfect example of what I'm talking about, especially with that Edward G. Robinson guy. Number 45. According to the movie's novel adaptation, Miles and his roommate Genki at the Brooklyn Visions Academy had a rocky start and eventually became friends by bonding over their mutual love for Spider-Man comics. Genki is a mainstay of the Miles Morales canon. Number 46. Penny stems from a futuristic New York. Her robotic Spidey suit responds to her DNA only. Number 47. Spider-Ham's civilian name is Peter Porker. And no, Spider-Ham is not a reference to the Simpsons movie or whatever your friend whose uncle works for Spider-Man told you. Spider-Ham is a real character from the comics, first debuting in 1983. Specifically, he's from Earth 8311, which sports a plethora of talking animal parodies of Marvel characters, including a Venom counterpart who is also a pig named Pork Grind. Of course I'm not making this up, how could I? Anyway, don't question why his hands are wet, he just washed them. No other reason. Number 48. In addition to the usual Spider-Man powers, Spider-Ham is able to throw a black circle onto a wall and climb through it. This is an idea first used in the Warner Brothers cartoon The Whole Idea from 1955 and has since been used and troped many, many times. Number 49. According to John Mulaney, the producers encouraged him to have fun with his role as Spider-Ham, so he ended up swearing a bunch when he would record improv takes. He eventually asked what the rating of the movie was, and he was told PG. Would love to hear those outtakes, though. Number 50. During the ending, Miles zips past a store called Perry Joe, a reference to Joe Perry, lead guitarist of Aerosmith and noted Spider-Man fan who performed the theme song for New Spider-Man. Number 51. During the coronavirus pandemic, Jake Johnson offered to record free personalized messages as Peter B. Parker for children under quarantine. Number 52. According to composer Daniel Pemberton, Miles' theme is a combination of the many facets of his character, including the sounds of a real aerosol can. Another theme that would appear in Insomniac Spider-Man Miles Morales, where Miles would swing around Manhattan recording natural or environmental sounds to eventually mix into beats. The writer of the script is now asking me to say what sorts of sounds I might use to compose my theme. <sighs> I don't know, man. Mouse clicks? Rainfall? Sad sighs? I don't like this game. Number 53. Prowler's signature siren noise has the sounds of an elephant as its base because the filmmakers wanted the noise to be frightening but also sad. Number 54. 
There are many small details in Miles' universe that set it apart from ours. New York City's police department is given the acronym PDNY, Police Department of New York instead of NYPD, New York Police Department. Conversely, the real-life FDNY, Fire Department of New York, is instead called the NYFD, New York Fire Department. Number 55. On a poster in Miles' room, Chance the Rapper is wearing a hat with the number 4 on it instead of the number 3. Number 56. Kingpin is modeled after the Kingpin in the Daredevil Love and War graphic novel from 1986 by Frank Miller and artist Bill Sienkiewicz. Number 57. Kingpin's flashback to his time with Vanessa and his son are also done in the art style of Sienkiewicz, paying further homage to the artist who inspired the design. Number 58. Kingpin is one of producer Phil Lord's favorite characters. Number 59. Miles and his friend do the same handshake on his way to school as Peter Parker and his best friend Ned did in Spider-Man Homecoming. Number 60. Penny Parker, created by Gerard Way of My Chemical Romance and Umbrella Academy fame, sports a design and animation style heavily inspired by anime. In another amazing attention to detail, Penny's lip flaps don't quite match in the same way as everyone else's, implying that her voice was dubbed into English. She was, in fact, designed this way, with Kimiko Glenn providing her voice. She also wears heelys, which are briefly visible in this scene, which is uh, objectively cool. Number 61. Penny Parker is one of the youngest heroes in the Spider-Verse. She began operating her suit after her father died when she was only nine. Number 62. According to a Vanity Fair article, the filmmakers were already in London scoring the film by the time they had the idea to do a holiday track. Phil Lord didn't know that Chris Pine, who plays Peter Parker in Miles' universe, could sing. The filmmakers were so blown away by Pine's singing that they immediately rushed into planning the holiday album. But if you're more into ice cream, he also has this, uh, so-so popsicle. Number 63. Among the song titles on Peter Parker's Christmas album are It's Cold Outside, Swingin' Around the Mistletoe, Silent Night, You're Welcome, Joy to the World, That I Just Saved, Spidey the Snowman, It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like a Non-Denominational Holiday, and Ave Maria. Number 64. In Miles' universe, the Scorpion is a Mexican criminal with cybernetic enhancements. The cybernetic parts are new, but Miles' version of the Scorpion from Ultimate Marvel is also Mexican. Number 65. Production designer Justin K. Thompson chose to give this film's Dr. Octopus a distinctive, unrefined look, rather than the polished metallic arms that Doc Ock traditionally wields. Number 66. Up until a year in production, Doc Ock was written as a man, but then the production team, I guess, also followed Peter B. Parker's note of re-examining their personal biases. Number 67. The art of electrocuting others by touch is known as Venom Strike. The Venom Strike and the ability to become invisible are two powers that Miles has in addition to the usual Spider-Man abilities. Number 68. The license plate number on Jefferson's police car is RFD 690, which is a common New York prop plate number appearing in various media, the most notable example being the lead detective's car in Law & Order. Number 69. In the Spider-Man comic that Miles reads, Spider-Man's real name is Billy Barker instead of Peter Parker. Since the comic book was published in a world where Spider-Man is a real person, the author supposedly uh, didn't know what Spider-Man's real name was and made one up. Number 70. The Planet Hollywood restaurant and resort chain is called Planet Inglewood. This also carries the implication that in Miles' universe, Inglewood is the heart of the American film industry. Number 71. While they're never named in the film itself, the band that Gwen plays drums for, the Mary Janes, has an advertisement that can be seen amongst the New York signage in Miles' universe. Number 72. The graffiti montage with Miles and Uncle Aaron was one of the earliest completed scenes and served as a lodestar moving forward to inform and inspire them with later scenes. Number 73. The filmmakers drew upon the real Large Hadron Collider in Geneva as inspiration for Kingpin's collider in the movie. The Large Hadron Collider is the largest and most powerful collider in the world. It's situated in a tunnel that has a circumference of 17 miles. Number 74. Director Bob Paraschetti had his wife and kids tag their names in the tunnels, which can be seen in a couple of shots. Number 75. The Kirby dots during the Collider sequence honor their namesake, Jack Kirby, a known comic book artist who would use that as sort of a way to show cosmic energy, and also worked at Marvel and DC Comics throughout his career. Number 76. In order to illustrate the multiple universes, the Sony Pictures ImageWorks technical team developed a camera array that could project seven different angles at once, allowing them to render each image in a different style. Number 77. When Peter and Miles meet with the other spider people in Aunt May's secret base, behind them are several pods containing more Spider-Man costumes. One of them has the white spider emblem on the chest like in Insomniac's original Spider-Man game, and in fact, all of the suits visible can be unlocked in that game. Number 78. Also shown in the secret base is the Spider-Mobile, a failed attempt by an auto dealership to use Spider-Man's likeness to market their vehicles with his permission for a lucrative cut. Number 79. 
In the finale, various buildings and objects appear within the Collider where the various spider people fight Kingpin and his goons. Among them are a subway train and a suspension bridge, both reference the locations of the climactic battles of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movies. Also, just as a bonus Sam Raimi reference, the kiss from Spider-Man 2002 is parodied during Ultimate Peter Parker's intro. Rather than Spider-Man kissing Mary Jane upside down because he's hanging from his web, Spider-Man is standing on the ground but Mary Jane is hanging upside down from a fire escape. Number 80. There's a billboard with Scarlett Johansson advertising Lucy with an E, an alternate universe version of Lucy. Number 81. Early in the film, Miles says that leaving his shoes untied was a choice, representing his irresponsible nature and misguided attempts to carve out an identity. He trips on his shoelace while training, causing him to break the goober. When he commits to the responsibility of being Spider-Man, his shoes are tied. Number 82. While the contents of the Spider-Man comic that Miles' roommate reads are entirely fictional, the cover is a reproduction of Amazing Fantasy number 15, Spider-Man's first appearance. Number 83. Tobey Maguire was almost cast as Peter B. Parker, but the filmmakers feared that audiences would find it too confusing. John Krasinski was also considered for the role at one point. Funnily enough, Spider-Verse may have in fact primed audiences for the multiversal plot of No Way Home, which was decidedly not confusing to modern moviegoers. Number 84. During a flashback sequence, when Peter B. Parker recalls his marriage to Mary Jane, he steps on a glass at the end of the ceremony. Many viewers took this as an indication that Peter B. Parker was being depicted as Jewish, an interpretation that was later verified by the movie's co-director Rodney Rothman in his February 2019 interview with Jerry Miller in the Jewish Journal. Number 85. In Miles' universe, Snapchat is still called Peekaboo and Google is still called Backrub, which were both their original names before rebranding into the megacorps we know today. Well, maybe not so much for Snapchat these days. Number 86. When the Peter of Miles' universe does his intro spiel at the start of the film, he's shown holding two vehicles from falling off each side of a bridge, which he did in the first big action scene of The Amazing Spider-Man. The pose he makes while holding the buses is a direct reference to the ferry sequence from Spider-Man Homecoming, where Peter tried to keep two halves of the Staten Island ferry from sinking. Number 87. The approval stamps on Miles' True Life Tales of Spider-Man comics are from the Cabin Fever production code rather than the Comics Code Authority. You may have noticed that this is a reference to the film's original working title. Number 88. Among the names in Miles' phone contacts are B. Bendis, Sarah Pacelli, and Jason Reynolds. Brian Michael Bendis and Sarah Pacelli are the writer and artist who created Miles Morales in Ultimate Spider-Man, and Jason Reynolds illustrated and wrote one of the comics. Number 89. In addition to creator cameos, Miles' contacts also include references to numerous characters related to Spider-Man, including Cindy Moon, Jessica Drew, Billy Braddock, Karn, Ezekiel Sims, and Monica Chang. Number 90. The inclusion of Alchemax instead of more well-known corporations of the Spider-Man mythos like Oscorp or Roxxon teases the appearance of Miguel O'Hara, aka Spider-Man 2099, in the post-credits scene. Number 91. The comic book Tale of Two Spider-Men that pops up on screen after Miles first discovers his powers is reminiscent of the Spider-Man 3 movie poster. Number 92. The What's Up Danger scene name was Rise Up in storyboard sequences. Number 93. Alex Hirsch, creator of Gravity Falls, was one of the story contributors to the film while being uncredited. He was also going to voice J. Jonah Jameson while doing his Grunkle Stan voice for the character, but couldn't do it due to his schedule. Number 94. Comic book artist Marcelo Vignali hand-drew some of the comics that Miles encounters in the film. Vignali was a big fan of the animated Spider-Man TV series. Number 95. When Peter B. Parker recalls how he came into Miles Morales' universe, you can see there are five blobs released when the Collider blows, foreshadowing the total number of other Spider-People pulled into this universe. Number 96. At the beginning of the film, the famous phrase, with great power comes great responsibility, is actually said by Cliff Robertson, who played Uncle Ben in the original Spider-Man trilogy with Tobey Maguire. The quote was pulled from Spider-Man 2002's archival footage as Robertson passed away in 2011. Number 97. Originally, Penny was going to die along with her mech, but this was deemed uh, too brutal for a kid's movie, so she survived the destruction. Number 98. A scene was pitched that would feature cameos from Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland, all playing their versions of Spider-Man from the Raimi, Webb, and MCU universes. However, this idea was scrapped. At the time, uh, that idea did sort of come back later. Number 99. The comic book version of Prowler wears green and purple, but production designer Justin K. Thompson and team gave him an all-purple costume for this movie. Number 100. Miles' physics test is dated December 2nd, 2018. While it's possible that the Ultimate Universe has a different calendar, a concert poster in Miles' dorm room shows a December date. Since Miles was purposely trying to fail the physics test, uh, Decembuary may have been yet another attempt to convince his teacher that he's too dumb to be attending the Academy. Number 101. 
The sneakers Miles wears are Nike Air Jordan 1 Retro High Tops. For the release of the movie, Sony and Nike worked together to develop the Air Jordan 1 Origin Story shoes, which are based on Miles' shoes. Number 102. This is the first non-Disney Pixar film to win the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature since Rango in 2011. Number 103. This was also the first Spider-Man film to win an Oscar since Spider-Man 2 in 2004, which won for Best Visual Effects. Number 104. When Miles first visit Uncle Aaron's apartment, the television is playing a clip from the show Community. The beginning of that episode shows Donald Glover's character Troy getting out of bed wearing Spider-Man pajamas, which was a reference to an unsuccessful 2010 online campaign to get Donald Glover a chance to audition for the lead role in The Amazing Spider-Man. Number 105. The success and popularity of the movie was felt deeply by Sony, who were quick to announce two sequels. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse, and also a spin-off movie which focuses on three generations of female Spidey heroes. Across the Spider-Verse is currently slated for release on June 2nd of 2023. Number 106. At the recent Annecy Film Festival, some of the sequel's plot was revealed, including the return of the Vulture and the appearance of Spider-Man 2099, who will be voiced by Oscar Isaac. And number 107. We also got a glimpse at Miles Morales' next foe, the Spot, whose entire body is covered in interdimensional portals made to feel like living ink that can send him anywhere he wants to go. He can also make these portals appear out of thin air to transport objects and people at will. Did you enjoy our list? What fact do you think we missed? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're there, be sure to subscribe and see more great videos. And remember, Frederator loves you.